Maria and I'm delighted to be your host for the third season of the Drag and Drop Show. Alex Antolino is a creative force. His sense of brand goes far beyond tactics, trends and presentation. His mission is to get to the core of it to understand how a brand can serve not just the organization, but also its customers, the community, and society at large. Alex came with a fresh perspective to the Typeform rebranding process. His background in video advertising made him keenly aware of everything going on in and around the organization, a sense he's cultivated and elevated to new heights. The way he talks about rebranding and the value of a brand will captivate you. It will stretch your understanding of what a rebrand is and what a rebrand does. Discover which sage unlocks the path to alignment. Learn about how important it is to allow yourself to change your mind and understand what strikes a balance between emotion and logic. I'm excited to share this high energy conversation with Alex Antolino, creative director at typeform.com and videos.com. It's Andra Zaharia here, bringing you the latest episode of the Drag and Drop Show by Creatopy. Hi, Alex. Welcome to the Drag and Drop Show. Super, super excited to have you here to talk about the Typeform rebrand and a lot of other things that are part of your legacy. So, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, your level of energy kind of um, overflows, you know, into everything that you do. And even if you don't get to talk too much about it, uh, I, um, you know, hopefully will dig into many aspects of your work today. So I'm, I'm kind of okay. excited to to talk about, you know, this brand that I love and that I've been using for such a long time um, that actually inspires that kind of energy. So I think that the way, you know, that the way that uh, your culture, your entire kind of company culture has evolved, I think that it really captures that sort of energy uh, and brings it to the table. So I'm really curious, you know, how you manage to do that and how you can constantly uh, manage to keep that feeling, that upbeat pace to everything that you do. So tell me, you know, how did it all start out? How did you know it was time for a rebrand at Typeform? Okay, so first of all, the rebrand happened like two or three years ago. Um, uh, but I joined Typeform five years ago ish. Um, my background is on film, so not many people know this. Um, some people get surprised when I say this, but my background is not actually design. My background is on film. So I studied film. I had my own studio. I was doing commercials uh, and TV ads for fashion companies and and tech companies. And then super randomly, I ended up at Typeform, um, which I didn't even know what a tech company was. I had no clue about Silicon Valley. Uh, it was super accidental, and I ended up you know, being hired at Typeform to do some videos. And um, and at some point, like when because I worked with fashion, um, when I was working on some video, I was like, "Where are the brand guidelines?" Right? And I remember asking this to one of the two CEOs, David Ogunyev, and he was like, "Well, um, I'll share them over." And uh, he sent me like an Illustrator file with like a logo and like a couple of colors, and I'm like, well, "I don't know if these are like the brand guidelines that I expected, right?" So, um, so I was like, I feel like we need to define a little bit, a little bit more what Typeform is. But again, it was more coming from like a, the cre the point of view of a creator that needed to do stuff for a brand that didn't know at that time, um, other than like a business um, need. That was the very beginning. So we didn't create a brand or anything at that time, but we did put together some let's say design guidelines for what Typeform was going to be. And I very soon realized um, some of you might know Typeform for a long time. Um, I don't know about you, um, but um, Typeform, when I joined, it was only like two colors, turquoise and white. And um, for those of you who remember that old Typeform, which was like turquoise and white, and there's also a mascot, like a new station mark. Anyway, it looked like a dentist, right? I'm like, dude, you're asking me to make videos for what you say it's a person, like a friendly, happy brand, but it, it looks like a dentist, right? So I, we need to do something about it. So we added some colors, but everything was very technical. Like it, it was very on the surface, right? Um, and this happened the first year. Um, I kind of like end up 
leading the project of um not a redesign but like a design expansion of the brand where like we would add some colors maybe change the typeface to something more unique and that was it for the first year and i guess that project went really well everyone got super excited we had new tools to express our brand and the company exploded at that time it were 30 people that we passed from 30 people to 150 in one year so it was mind-blowing and um, the company needed um, a team to create communications and i i was at that time in that place and I, it became the creative director so to your question it was there's all this journey that startups you know all every company has their journey and for me it was like the, being there at that moment and asking for this and then after having done this and having a creative team we realized that the brand that we had was basically like a frankenstein of many decisions taken at different at different times and places by different people right there was no really like a like a clear idea and that was an issue for me as a creative director running five or six people at that time um because i didn't know everything was based on my approval everything was based on what i thought and i didn't want to run the team like that and it was creating a lot of friction because we didn't have guidelines it was not clear for people people uh designers were not empowered to make their own decisions right mm -hmm. um exactly Be yeah before we move on kind of i want to unpack a little bit because you you know you shared so much and there's so much that happened in this you know in in such a short time span that i like yeah. to dig in a bit more so when you sure. came in you know there were not there wasn't like a design core design system uh it wasn't that kind of formalized but you were there and you kind of set the um you did the groundwork to get everyone on the same page. What was it like to, you know, to be able to align the team at a time where it grew so, so fast, you know, tripling its basically its size? Because that's a huge thing, you know, onboarding people, getting them to connect emotionally to the company culture and to what the brand means and to its identity so they can further express it so they can do their work really well and connect with others. That's so important, but there's also very kind of very, very subjective things. So so how did you get them aligned? How did you talk to them? How did you go about, you know, taking this core and making it part of everyone's work at the end of the day? Um, all right. So everything that I explained so far is up until the moment that we decided that we needed a rebrand, right? Mm. And um, we started doing some strategy work. And at some point we stopped there because I knew we didn't have the expert, the expertise or the experience enough to pull it out. Um, with the level that I wanted to have, right? That's when we hired Design Studio. Uh, the the Design Studio, they're called Design Studio, but it's the Design Studio behind Airbnb brand and Deliveroo. Um, and so we hired them to work on the, our visual identity and help us a little bit with um, the rebrand, right? I wanted to make this very clear because up until there, uh, up until that moment, we didn't really have anything. So. It was that year when I became creative director that I was commissioned with, with the need to create um, to build a creative team from scratch, and I started bringing people in. But that took like a lot of like a, a, at least a year, and it was very chaotic, as you said. Like um, there were no one knew where what to hold on to, and so a, a little bit at the beginning it was based on you know my approval, my feedback, which didn't really work, and it was definitely not scalable at all. Um, and that was, for me at least, one of the reasons to say we need to create some, you know, some document or so, some agreement on what is this brand about. Then we realized that it was also not working for the customer, or it was kind of working, but it was not pushing us in the direction we wanted to go. So that's when we said, okay, I talked with David, um, again, one of the founders, and I said, David, I think we need to do this, um, and we did it. So I'm just saying this because up until that moment, it was chaos. <laughs> and then after we launched the rebrand, the rebrand was actually a huge tool for alignment internally, right? So, um, and that's the whole process. For me, it took like, I think we spent 10 years doing, i sorry, 10 years, 10 months <laughs> um, doing the rebrand. Which re felt like 10 years, it probably. It felt like 10 years, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so it was like 10 months and um, and a lot of it, as you said, was getting everyone aligned. So quick example, um, 
I would go one week to work in London with um, design studio. They would come one week, right? And we had like five or six stages for the whole process. So brand strategy, uh, concept, design, blah, 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 right? So at the end of each one of these big stages that would take for like a month or a month and a half, I would do small meetings personally with everyone in the company um, to present our progress and, and get their feedback. It was more like an alignment thing. Um, of course, some very interesting feedback came from very unexpected places, but um, I personally wanted to do this because I didn't want everyone to feel that this was imposed to them, but they were part of the process. And this was one of the best decisions I made because we didn't go with a big reveal of the logo or anything, I think, but by the moment, we actually did a big event internally where we presented the brand, but it was not a surprise or a reveal. It was more like a celebration of the of the brand and the new direction and stuff. There was no like madman kind of moment where I said, "This is the new logo. If you don't like it." I love that. I love that. I think that is so so important because. Again, this is not a cosmetic thing. So rebrands are not, you know, they're not a surface things or they shouldn't be. Uh, that's just one side, you know, that's been popularized and talked about and things like that. Uh, but it's, it's, there's so much more to it be below the surface. And I think that the value is in the way that I see it, you know, looking from the outside in uh, and sometimes obviously participating, you know, as, as a content creator in these things is that the conversations that th this process starts Starts and that this process involves are actually the ones that shape everything. The conversations you have mm -hmm. with your peers, with your teams, with yeah. uh, agencies, everyone else. So I'm very curious, you know, kind of what kind of questions did you use to try to figure out, you know, what your new brand identity is, what your values are and how you want to take them forward? Because I assume they haven't changed a lot. Did they change a lot? They actually did change a lot. <laughs> um, the truth is that um, I mean I, I was I would say I was very naive. That was my big like project up until the date. Um, as I said, I was a filmmaker, right? And I that was my first experience as a creative director. That was my first experience with doing like a rebrand, right? Um, so I had to catch up very quickly with a lot of things. Um, and uh, and we actually work on with Design Studio on um, a concept, some values principles, um, a lot of these things, and a, and a value proposition, right? And we roll it out internally and externally. So we created like, uh, we implemented the whole visual identity, we put it out, and like, I think I would say like six to 10 months later, we initiated internally another project to kind of like readjust the brand proposition. It, it was just not working. It was not working for us. It was not working with the communication. So we got, we changed it right that is very bold that's very bold that you gave yourselves kind of permission to go back you know sometimes people when they get into these things because they invest so much time energy money and so on in them they tend to kind of not be able to let go of some costs they'll, they'll just go with it until the end no matter what the risks are so yes. what kind of what kind of things do you think made this decision easier to like hey this is not working for us we need to readjust I have no idea, and you have a really good point. It, it, it didn't feel easy doing it, um, especially just because you said like you said so. Like we invested so much time, and it was like we sold it to the entire company, right? <laughs> um, and to like founders, CEO, like like everyone, right? And so we decided to change it because it was not just not working. It, it just didn't. It just didn't feel right for us. It just didn't feel it was what we wanted to say, right? And um, and to be honest, it's changed again after we did that. So it's not like, and this was, I like that you asked me this question because that was like a big learning for me and it has changed a lot on how I approach brands actually because of my, because I was very naive. Um, I had this idea of what branding is and what a visual identity is and what advertisement is from what I saw in my experience, but I, 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 it was my real first experience on a company and running it, right? And I realized that very soon that brands are something organic. It's not something that you do one day and then it, you know, it lasts for like five or 10 years, like it happened before. Mm. Um, now brands are alive, right? And they change every month and every, 
and every year, right? Slightly. Not saying you're going to change the logo every month or every year, but they evolve, right? And if you look at every single brand um, two years ago, it's slightly different, right? And if they're slightly different on the surface, probably means that they changed a lot on the inside. So so that was a big learning for me. And um, now we launched one year ago, we launched uh, the pro our new product, Video Us, which is kind of like online forms, but with video. Um, and uh, and I'm running this brand since early January, so I kind of like shifted my role, and now I'm like kind of like doing what, what I did for a type from, but now with video ask. And my my approach is totally different. Um, to the point that in what that, sense? Um, in, in what yes. ways? Tell me, tell me a bit yeah, about exactly. that. Exactly. So mm -hmm. so it was not that. For example, I'm, a quick example. I collaborated on the design of it with um, a good friend of mine who worked at type from before. Um, and uh, we collaborated to create the visual identity of Video Ask, right? Um, but what, bef what for Typeform took me like 10 months to figure out with like strategy, blah, 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 all these kind of things, with Video Ask took like one year, one month and a half. And the whole thing from beginning to ending. And the reason is not because we wanted to do it like, like in a more scrappy way or because we were rushing or anything. It's just like because we were putting the the focus on somewhere else. We were putting the focus on our community, right? And this is something that is a big shift for me in how I approach brands. And and for example, at Typeform, this is not gonna sound nice, but at Typeform, for whatever reason, I didn't get the chance to talk with users at all, basically. Maybe like a couple of times or three times, but it was not something I was doing on a regular basis, talking with users. Of course, when we did the rebrand, yes, we did focus groups and things like that, but it's not like every week I had a call with a user, which is how my life looks like at Video Ask since day one. And I guess that's also like um, David, one of the co like one of the co-founders um, at Typeform, is who created Video Ask and is is and he's running Video Ask now. So I work with him, and I think that I, we haven't talked about this, but I would say this is also one of his learnings that from day one, he set up a Slack, a Slack community and he invited new users from day one, right? Even before launching the product for like better, better users and, and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that, it's been a game changer. What kind of questions do you ask users, you know, through these conversations? Because, you know, so many people talk about and know that you should, especially in the startup world and in the tech world, that you need to talk to your customers to figure out, you know, how your product is evolving, how they're changing, how you're changing, and, you know, how it all fits together. But I think that the secret is not in just having these conversations, but in how you have these conversations. So I'm very curious, you know, how your um, questions look like now versus the type of questions that you used uh, in the Typeform rebrand. And, and I'm curious, yeah. you know, what that looks like in real life. <laughs> I think it's it's not that much about the questions, but the topics and the, and how we approach the conversation and the relationship basically. So before I would just jump on a call with with a user, ask them some questions, and then get my conclusion, then move on with my life. Uh, it's more like now we're like developing relationships in a sense that there are some users because I host a, pod, a podcast too for videos, right? And I invite. Um, some like uh, some users that I consider they have great stories or great, great point of views, and with these people I just develop a relationship. You know, it's like it's not like uh, you know we have one interaction. I ask them some questions and I move on. But more like, first of all, it comes. I I like to say this framework where like first it's more about like curiosity. So I I'm generally interested in learning how they use the product in different ways. Mm -hmm. Then it's building a relationship, like talking with them, understanding, really listening to them and understanding how they're using our product. And if I think it's interesting, it's all about supporting them and celebrating their success with our product, right? So I would invite them to the podcast. I would feature them on the website. Before COVID happened this year, um, I set up the goal for a video ask, just so you can see the difference on approach, right? Um, for so actually, let me give you this this um, this thing. On Typeform, when we implemented the new rebrand two three years ago, to go out, we needed a big like a lot of imaginary right pictures right. We wanted mm -hmm. to make a very people driven brand, so we we needed a lot of pictures, and we didn't have much time because we implemented the whole brand in like 
a couple of months, which is insane. Um, so uh, what I did at that time was find photographers that I liked and ask them for their personal pictures. From they would they would go and um, you know they in general photographers they take pictures when they're travel right. So what I did is like they have they some of them they have this on their portfolio. So I called a couple of friends of mine like can I buy these pictures? Can we get the rights and the, the right release for those pictures? And I bought those pictures. And they these those pictures form the the, the library of images that we used at the at Typeform at the beginning, right? And that's why it felt so authentic and so real and because it was real. It was photographers taking pictures of their friends, right? When they were like having fun. So that was for Typeform. For video ask at the beginning of the year, I set up a goal that I said we're not going to use anything of barely anything of stock images. We're going to use only stuff from our customers, which is a bold challenge because that means you actually need to know and get there. And it's, I mean, for every single landing page, you need to go there. Um, when COVID strike, um, things were more complicated because we couldn't move and it was not easy. And not every customer knows how to take pictures. Um, like we need those pictures to be taken. So um, we it was a mix of employee, the images we took, it was a mix of employees and our our customers. But if you look at our website now and you scroll in videos.com, you're gonna see that 80, 70% of the images, for example, are from customers. And we feature only customers. Of course, there are still, I'm not gonna say you can create ads and everything like this, but I'm happy that at least 70% ish or 80, and this is mostly because of COVID, um, that we cannot travel in and make things more complicated in that sense. It's coming from customers. So just so you see the difference on approach, right? On like some very pragmatic stuff. That is huge, but it you know listening to you, I still feel like your your you know your vision and kind of you're you're pulling this all off together, and not only that, but you're getting people to kind of resonate with your way of thinking, and you know you get them you get their buy in actually to you know embark on something so daring as to use seventy percent user generated content, which is a lot. I mean, we know that user generated content is so big, like we've been talking about it for over a decade, but uh, the way that you use this is, you know, it's not just contest, it's not, it's, you give it power, you give it weight, you turn it into something meaningful, you you bring it together. And, you know, this is Thank something you. that I particularly love about the power of a brand. Uh, and we're mm -hmm. talking a lot about this because I feel like this year more than ever, you know, there's an emphasis on relationships. We feel that need for connection with both the people in our lives, but the brand in our lives, especially. Uh, you know, because we use so many products, because we need these uh, this, as human beings, we, we feed off of it. So I think that yeah. the way you bring this together is very bold. And I was wondering, you know, when you do a rebrand, obviously there are some risks that you have to live with. Uh, so kind of what do those risks look, sli look like and how do you kind of pick and choose them? Because to me, that's where kind of the, where the difficult decisions are. Well, I think in general for every rebrand, and of course I can talk about my experience, but it's super, super different, um, different depending on, on the size, I would say, of the company and the stage of this company. So it's not the same for like to create a brand for a, even if they have some kind of like look and feel or something like that. Because usually what ha when a rebrand happens is when you have a company that's grown a little bit and they have some design that kind of like they replicate on all of them all of their communications but they don't really know where this design actually is coming from according to what they want to do today right mm -hmm. this is usually when a company says we should rebrand or someone in the company says we should you know rebrand just to understand what this company is about and how we need to put it out to engage with our people right but it, it's it's in general it, it really depends um on the size of the company. So if it's like a small company, like a 10 people company or something like that, or 20 people company, it's not the same as if it's like a 200, 300 people company like Typeform it is today, right? Um, it's very different. So I would say, based on my experience, uh, the main challenge is actually get truthful buying from leadership team. I would say this is the, 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 at least for me and my experience with the, 
the two brand the the, the the brands that I've worked on, mostly like Typeform. Um, it was hard, you know, like because sometimes on meeting, I mean, I don't like in meetings people would arrive and they they pay all your attention, all their attention, and they decide things, right? But sometimes it's hard to let them understand the the consequences or like the implications of those decisions, mm. right? And this is what happened with Typeform the first time, rebrand, that even though it was not 100% clear for a couple of people, a couple of persons, we decided to say, okay, like we can like agree and commit to this and move forward. But then the truth is that some of those people were not like 100% in, and this generates a lot of, so I would say that one of the main issues is really making sure that they understand the implications because not many people, even people working on branding, they not really, not everyone really understands the implications. And then the second one is like making sure that when they say, yes, I buy it, they really buy it, you know? This is, for me, was the, you know, that was, and 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 I think that's it because the rest is just it's just work, you know, like um, getting everyone in the company to move on. Um, it just patient is a big challenge. Also, I'm not a very patient person, but in general, uh, these kind of things require a lot of patience because it's branding is a long term thing, so it's hard to see results. So another challenge would be help educate people in the company who needs to see results fast but they won't get results mm. fast. I was getting people to ask, ask ask me, okay, but like, how did it go? Um, you know, how much are we selling? And even some people saying, oh, our, our, our sales dropped, you know? And I'm like, well, what do you expect? You know, like we've changed the, the, the brand. Of course, some, you know, it's gonna drop a bit, you know? Um, but then the challenge here is like understanding that branding is a long-term thing. It's like, going to the gym you know you're not going to see the results the first week you need to like go maybe for like six months or a year to actually then compare to pictures and be like fuck yeah you know like i know this now and with branding it's the long-term thing and then it's also it's a holistic effort it's not something that can happen on a design team it's just the, the design team is probably going to deliver the visual identity, but that's not your rebrand. Your rebrand is the strategy, is a lot of different things, right? And so understanding the impact holistically, it's just really hard. It's like, if I want to get in good shape and get healthy, um, probably I'm going to start going to the gym or wor wor doing workout every morning, but then probably I'm going to have to start eating well, quit, uh, cut alcohol, and all those kind of things, maybe spend some time outdoors, all these kind of things, right? Um, but then if I look back, um, after six months and I realize there's a big difference, how am I going to attribute what had the biggest impact and in what measure, right? Was, was the, the diet, was it the workout? Was it this couple of weeks that I spent outdoors doing hikes? You know, what was it? And it's the sum of all those things. And it's really hard. That's why people say brands are hard to measure. It's not, it's not because people are dumb and they, they, they don't know how to measure things. It's because it's a holistic thing and it's a long-term thing. I've been nodding vigorously here because I support so much what you said. You talk about it so beautifully and so articulately. Uh, I think that this kind of the same principles apply to everything that's related to organic growth, you know, to building something that people uh, kind of viscerally uh, feel and they, you know, they resonate with. It's it's the same with content marketing. Like, hey, you can you put in a lot of effort into educating people, into helping them, into building the community and with so many other things. But you can't directly tie that or transfer that into monetary value simply because it's so much more than that and that's why you know we see brands like apple who have like such incredible super hyper focused uh very into it kind of that that sort of community you cannot buy that type of things but you can build it gradually in time with investment and patience and care and thoughtfulness just like you talked about Absolutely. and i loved you know how you talked about managing expectations managing expectations mm -hmm. so so important and i truly believe that 
you know, to pull off any kind of big thing, uh, something that's tied to, to identity, to what people truly want, you, you absolutely have to have that management buy-in and to have them, you know, do the follow through because like you said, a rebrand is not just a point in time. It is a process and it's a process that's basically happening all the time. It's just that sometimes it translates into a, a visual transformation or a transformation that you can see that you can, well, touch sometimes depending on the swag that you get or that type of product you interact with. So I'm really, I, I love how you, you talk about it as, you know, how passionately, but also pragmatically, because there's mm-hmm. kind of balancing emotion and logic, like you mentioned in your article, you know, about the, the type forms redesign. To me, that is an art form. And it, it all is, isn't it? When you're kind of dealing with people's emotions. <laughs> I think, it has an artistic component if you want, but at the end of the day, it's very important to um, have a very clear idea that a brand is um, it's a business tool. And uh, it's very, I like that you mentioned this because I always say that brands are like people, right? Um, I didn't know how to build a brand at the beginning. I didn't know how to create a visual identity because I was not a designer. Um, so I studied then after like maybe a couple of years ago, I studied my master's on graphic design because I was running designers and I had no design background. But when I did the rebrand, I had, I was not a designer. Right. And so I think what's important is to understand that brands are business tools. Right. And if they don't serve the business, they are not good tools and they need to be looked at. Right. And I think, yes, there's like an, um, an artistic side of it if you want because at the end of the day it's kind of like it's expression in a way and so in that sense yes I can I understand what you say but it's very important to understand and make it very clear that that expression needs to serve a business goal because I've seen um, visual identities that are very interesting and very nice but at the end of the day if they don't work um they don't work you know what i mean they yes need to be changed. yes and um, especially and online I, you know it's such a different thing it's such a different medium to mm. kind of inspire emotion to get people to connect to something to get people to do something it's so much easy you know it's so much more challenging to do it online and to do it for a product you know for software as a service product uh that is basically a data capturing kind of machine and that's what it is but the way that you do that makes all the difference and I've always found this to kind of be the differentiator that made Typeform stand out Uh, and I think that the rebrand really played on these strengths very much as compared to you know all the other similar tools in the market and that's why why I was kind of drawn to it myself. (laughs) I think the reason why this happened and that w- why you perceive it this way is because there will there was actually a lot of trust in that pro- in the process, right? For whatever reason, um, um, I initiated that process and I got a lot of trust and like basically everyone was behind it um, for the process, right? And this uh, it's really hard to find in different companies. Type for me is a design driven company. Um, the, their founders were designers, um, and that's like that's a big difference. Like no one really. Yes, a couple of people asked me, okay, so but at the end of the, how much money we spent on the rebrand and where are the results um, in general, people from marketing. But um, but, in, but the founders who were behind the whole thing never asked this. And it's not because they were not interested. It's because I would say they un, they understood better that it's just like it's something that you just need to go and keep doing. You know, it's like and, and keep evolving. You know, it's like if you – if you fuck it up and like and 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 your logo doesn't really work, you can change it. You know, like lucky enough, we don't live in the era of like you know um, TV advertisement and like big billboards um, for tech companies. We can literally just push a button and change our logo in every single channel, right? This was not possible like two, 20 years ago. And I think that that's a big difference on how we build brands because brands are alive and brands need to react like people. That's why I say brands are like people because brands need to be context aware. They need to evolve. And um, and, and, and it's normal. It's part of the process. And this is something I learned with Typeform. Um, having to change actually type form when we introduced the logo it had like a circle now we're getting rid of this circle because it's not functional and, it, and it's okay like it's part of the it's part of the process right and I really like that you mentioned before I wanted to make a note on that you mentioned Apple um, so the key for companies and small startups who are watching this um, if you need to do a rebrand or something like that just 
make sure that you give the space and the trust to believe in the process, hire a good partner or, or hire good employees that are going to take charge of this and work on this and just trust them and leave them space and don't ask them for results very soon. That's my point of view as a creative director. Of course, you might be a founder or marketer, you might have other point of view and that's super fair, but just think about something. I watched the Apple keynote the other day on my sofa um, for like an hour, okay? I don't know if you've watched it, but they yes. introduced, um, yeah. So I wanna talk about the first chapter where they introduced this HomePod or whatever mini version. Um, so the keynote starts and then um, Tim Cook, right? I think that's his name. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So Tim Cook shows up and then he starts talking about the new products and then he introduces the HomePod or whatever it's called, this you know, like Alexa thing for by Apple, right? Um, and then all, the, all of a sudden we go into this amazing um, studio and we see literally a house they built inside that studio and the camera starts moving around on all those rooms. Now... I know it's Apple, they are like, they have loads of money, but these are the kind of things that in the normal companies are hard to pitch because you always have some uh, on like, imagine the pitching room where someone says, yes, so we'll build a home, entire home, six rooms, two floors, a garage, and we're going to put a car there and uh, we're going to move the camera around just to explain the features of this thing that uh, we're launching. It's hard to imagine someone being like, yes, here's the money, right? They're going to be like, yeah, but like, can we do like post-production? Can we do, you know, all these kind of things, you yeah. know, like, can we? These are the kind of things that build your brand. Apple wouldn't be Apple if they would not do these kind of things. And of course, they could have told the story in a different way, but they did it like this and they decided to do it for, for very clear reasons, in my opinion. And I think those are the... If you ask, okay, but what's the ROI of building this entire, you know, set with two floors and versus like, I don't know, maybe do it in a different way. It's hard, you know, what's the impact of that studio? It's hard. It's probably thousands and thousands of dollars to build that. But how do we measure? It's hard, but they did it for a reason, right? And I think these are the kind of things that you just need to trust the process and your strategy and go with it. Some things you're going to measure, some other things you're not going to be able to measure, and that's fine. But that's my point of view. And your point of view is super valuable because I think that this plays so much into building on your strengths. If you want to differentiate, you really have to follow through on what you believe in. And if you believe in uh, creating like human connection and empowering that if you believe in creating you know beautiful solutions that uh, please not only you know our, our need for the actual problem solving but our kind of a, our need for aesthetic things for things that are beautiful for things that make us feel good then you're gonna mm -hmm. put a price on that and I love how you talk about you know not being able to uh, capture the full ROI because I think that in many ways branding is very similar to company culture and of course they kind of combine mm -hmm. and they and they combine to to create brand the brand especially because you know if you want to have a strong company you need to have an internal culture that's just as strong because otherwise you're not going to be able to you know hire the best people have the best processes uh you know stimulate creativity mm. and all those and all of those things and branding is exactly the same it's that identity that core identity that people resonate with because we're so you know we're so emotional and I'm not, i i bet that you know that that better than I do. Uh, as human beings, we're emotional. We make emotion-driven decisions, and we think of ourselves yeah. as hyper-rational and things like that. But you know, we both know that the truth is is kind of at the opposite of that. Um, so you know, giving this creative space and and believing in what you're trying to achieve. Because at the end of the day, like, hey, what are we trying to achieve here, and how are we going to do this? And if everyone's on board, that makes everything easier. That's how you were able to actually implement, you know, that rebrand in what three months which is insane for a software as a service there are so many things you have to update that's just an, enor an enormous amount of work it yeah and it was two months <laughs> so it, it was, <laughs> oh, wow. it, was yeah. great. it was it was it was not easy <laughs> so how did you pull it off you know you you mentioned that obviously you know you need to have like buy-in from uh from c-level management from the company leaders but who else has a stake in this kind of who do you who else do you need to count on to pull this off 
Yes, I think it, it I, again, it depends on the size of your company. For us at Typeform, we were at like 100 people at that time or 150, 150 people. Co-founders and CEOs would re, would report to investors. So I didn't ever had to, you know, talk about this with investors. Um, I just had to get everyone on board with the idea of a rebrand, mostly like our CEOs, and then just like get, you know, input and feedback with the, from the leadership team and, 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 and see the key objections that were, um, popping up, uh, from employees in general, just to make sure that I was not, you know, losing any point of view or anything like that. Um, so I, but I, but that's it, honestly, like, um, you just need to like the people who make the calls and every single employee be on board with it. Um, and just like, you know, at the end of the day, it's funny. Cause like, it's, it's, it's to, what you want the brand to be, do, what you want the brand to do with your customers, which is make, tr generate trust. That's why we build tr brands, right? To generate trust. That's the only, in my opinion, the only, fo the only goal of a brand. So you need to embark on that process yourself. If you're, leading a rebrand within the company mm -hmm. so it's uh it's funny it's like kind of like an inception of like i need to create a brand but then i need to convince these people so i can convince then other people so i don't know for me it's like it, i mean it's beautiful it's a beautiful way it's kind of like bringing everyone in the same direction and listening to everyone and having great conversations and it's part of the game i guess you know to to incorporate those things the users it's important to understand them for i would say for a rebrand but I would not let users dictate how my brand is going to be. At least today, maybe we have another conversation in a year, I tell you the opposite. But at least today, and what I, what I know now is that I want to know my customers very well and understand their needs and their, and their desires and their passions and their problems. But then I will decide how the brand needs to feel and needs to behave to help them. Because they don't really know what they would they would they would need you know what i mean in terms of the our brand because they don't know what a brand is necessarily you know someone buying i don't know this doesn't understand what the brand is necessarily so careful also with some people being like super super uh, user driven in the sense that we're gonna do what the users want even i got even someone once asking me can a brand be tested can, can we do like two visual identities and do and do 180 test and i'm like would you actually go to a job interview and A-B test how you need to dress, you know, like it's not, you know what I mean? You just need to decide. And then if that didn't work, then okay, optimize it. But um, at some point you need to make some decisions here. Yes, and own them and go with them. And I think that that's where, right, that's where kind of that exact uh, kind of decision making and your create, creative direction and following, you know, part of your gut as well, because intuition is actually our experience and that informs, you know, our decision making. And I feel like it's very important to talk about this, you know, it's very important to talk about a thing that there is no perfect roadmap for a rebrand. I feel there are no recipes, there are no exact checklists. And I love that you emphasize emphasize that it's different for everyone and you kind of I think that trusting the process is about just that you need to figure your way around you know what this entire thing means and what it means for the company and your peers and your in the, your place in the industry or in the world and those are some very difficult questions and you're not always going to find perfect answers to them are you <laughs> yeah I think I want to make a note on this I do think there's a clear process it's just the outcome and the way you tackle that process, it's different depending on the business, right? But there is a process that you can follow and it's not like some thing that you need to figure out from scratch every time. Otherwise, I will be out of business as a creative director if I if I don't know what I'm doing and if there's no process and I need to make up the process, uh, I can, you know, like that's not, I always say that there's, um, I like this, you know, you would go for like a, to hire a design um, company to do something and they would go, because I've, I've, I've heard, I, I, this happened to me, they would be like, oh, but like, I was like, what's the process? And they were like, they would be like, oh, there's no, you know, it really depends, we're going to see over time. I'm not hiring you. If you don't know what's the process to create something, either you're not telling me because you don't want to, you know, put your secrets out or you don't have a process. And if you don't have a process, I don't want to work with you. I'm, so don't get me wrong. I'm very process oriented and there is a process, 
that I follow and that people follow. So first you, you do strategy. There are some things you can do to figure out your strategy. Um, so I just don't want to figure out, um, freak out people listening here that, oh my God, is this thing that we're going to have to figure out on the way? No, I figure it out looking at the internet, you know what I mean? And then we're collaborating with a big agency and learning from them and they sold me a, a very clear process with stages and milestones and all these kind of things. So there is a process. What I meant is that it's different for every company in the sense that how you apply it, right? And um, and who has more. So for a for a three people company, you don't need to do like all these process of alignment every stage, you know, you know, because it's only three people. It's it's really hard to not get to get three people disaligned. Right? You know what I mean? In that sense, it it differs from companies and the size of the companies and the nature of those companies. But the process. It's it's one at least the one that I use and it's 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 very clear and, and can be followed. Mm. And what do you think is one of the key stages of that process? So if you were to kind of look at it and break it down into its kind of its main components, what do you feel is the one where things change or where things start to come together and really you know make sense? The first sense? one, the <laughs> first one, understanding. Understanding, listening is the most important thing. Like in every relationship in life, when you don't listen to other people, you start losing those people, right? And I think that's the key underestimated stage of every, not rebrand, but even like a, a creation of a brand. Understanding the market, your product, your business, your company, your employees, and your customers. All these four elements you need to understand to then start making some decisions and start putting strategy in place. And this stage sometimes is not done properly. Sometimes it's overlooked. Um, I would say I didn't. I, I wouldn't say we nailed it with Typeform. We got closer than we, we that we were um, because we were very far. But like, but I would say that's a critical step. And actually, this reflected on how we did the rerun at Typeform. Of those 10 months that I said that we spent doing the rebrand, I would say about six or, or seven months were only for concept. So it was a process that on paper was going to last six months. By month, by, by month number six, we only had the brand proposition, the values, and the manifesto, and all those kind of things. The line. The first iterations and, and visualizations of the brand took like a month and a half. We gave them feedback. They came back after two weeks, two weeks, and we said, okay. So the execution of the visual identity, it's, if you have a very clear idea, it's simple. What's mm. really hard is understanding do your customer well, because this also takes takes time. Even if you do all the steps right, you need time to digest and form your ideas and let them breathe. It's like every creative process needs time. Um, it's like when you're like, if there's a filmmaker on on the audience, like if you're making, I mean, you do content, right? So there are some videos that you just need to let them sit for a night or for a couple of nights, and then you'd be like, you know, you find something special for the brand. For branding, is the same. Like you need to let those things sit over a little bit of time. So it's impossible to make uh, a brand in like a week or two weeks. You just need some time. Otherwise, you're going to roll it out, which you can do, and then realize, oh, shit, you know, and now you need to change it. <laughs> but, but that's OK. But um, That is so, so true. Um, I love how you, you know, you have this incredible, creative, kind of exuberant, uh, you know, not just personality, but just the way you conduct yourself and the way you think, but it's also balanced by this, this fierce discipline that I feel is coming from you. And I think that one can't live without the other. We're, I think, trained to believe that creativity only happens in a space where there are no rules. But actually, you know, working with limitations is what I think makes us a lot more creative. And we can see that a lot in the startup 100%. world. We can, we can see that in the tech world. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's essential that you talked about gaining clarity because that's where things have to 
connect, that's where we have those aha moments, those small epiphanies or whatever everyone calls them. Uh, and we need to let our brain breathe. We need to, that's why it, you, you tell other people to like get a good night's sleep and sleep on it and sleep on an important decision simply because you need that. Our brain as humans needs that time uh, to just sift through everything and, and you know, sit with that tension and, and figure its, its own way out of whatever situation it is. So I'm very curious, you know, how did this, you've obviously, you know, evolved a lot as a creative leader, you know, as, as a leader within the company, as a culture creator, both inside the company and outside of it through your entire work. How, how did these kind of branding and then uh, rebrand, the type from rebrand and then the branding for uh, Video Ask, how did they change you? You know, how did they change your perspective? Uh, you've told, you've kind of given us some little nuggets, but what's kind of the main thing that you felt changed for you throughout these experiences? I've changed a lot from like, from when I joined Typeform in these five years, I'm like a totally different person when it comes to how I relate to others at work, how I approach process, um, approach um, projects. When I was on the film industry, um, you usually, when I had my studio, it was a very small studio, like three, four people. And then we would, for every project or shooting, we would um, work with um, contractors, right? Um, so when you're used to working with contractors, the only thing that really matters is the output, especially on the on the film industry or on the um, on the especially in the advertisement industry. If you're on the filmmaking part of it, it's very output driven because you only have like 24 hours or like 48 hours to make like this very expensive piece of content. I'm talking about traditional advertisement on video, and it's just it's so output driven that like it's super harsh, you know, a shooting is like crazy. And people just, I would say based on my experience, they support each other, but they also, they're thinking, and I was thinking that too, it's fine, I can take anything because it's only for 48 hours. Or the pre-production, it's only for like this crazy two weeks, then I'm gonna take well, two week vacation, right? And this is how a lot of people live when they shoot commercials for TV, for example. Um, when I joined Typeform, and compared to how I feel and how I work today and or in the, or in the recent years, I think the main conception, it, it has, there's two main things that have changed for me. One is on, 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 on the, the things that I create, and the other one is on the, on the way I create those things with people, right? So in terms of like how I create those things with people, before I used to think and behave like I was, I was executing stuff with my team through other people, mm -hmm. right? So this is what we need to do and I will execute it through you because you have the skills that I don't have, but we will do what I think has to be done. That's when I started Typeform because that's, that's how you behave when you're like on a small studio, a studio like shooting stuff. You hire someone, a contractor for a couple of days to do what you want to do. And then they go, you pay them and next move on. You work with someone else. And I, I brought that mindset at the beginning and it was very challenging because you can do this if it's like a two day commercial, but if you're gonna work for some with some people for like two years, it's a no go. Like, and that was my biggest learning in terms of like management and relationships. Now, I think my job is kind of like set the vision and empower others to get there in their own terms and help them and motivate them to get the most out of them and feel happy and feel excited when they do those things. So what this generates is a, it's a change on how I approach the output of my work before I was super perfectionist and I wanted everything to be exactly as I wanted. So even like this needs to be this way and may have a very clear idea because I was directing commercials. I had storyboards, I have mood boards. It has to be as it, as it was, right? On the treatment day or whatever. Now, I really don't care about the output. I care, I care more about the content and about the relationships built on that process. And that may sound a bit fluffy, but it's not. When I put content on Instagram for video ask, for example, I care more about the contents and their reactions and their feedback and learning from them 
so we can actually deliver better features so i can deliver better content so for me content it's just an excuse to learn to create better content where before i would just put it out and just hey we're happy it's done let's celebrate not even look at data so that's been my my biggest change one in first up relationship in terms of relationships with other people and the other in terms of the output i think today it's all about relationships it's all about being personal and understanding your customers and your content your ads your even your product it's just a way to make those relationships better oh wow you captured that so so beautifully and i think that you know that's Thank kind you. of the challenge and the beauty of working in software as a service it always keeps you there it keeps you learning it keeps you present you have to be aware of everything all the time and that's what makes you better because you're not just doing things with a limited cycle that only kind of has these stages that you go through but it's constantly evolving it's evolving to match people's mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, changing mm -hmm. behaviors and to me i think that is you know that's why i find it it's so difficult to work in this space it's so challenging but it's also so incredibly rewarding not just because they're insane there's insane growth and there's like all the hyped up kind of startup people you know uh just trends yeah, and things know. it's it's because there is so much value in in doing the work and keeping this process alive and following it and teaching others to grow through it as well uh, and then giving them that decision making power to um actually run with it and and make the work their own because that's that's what it is at the end of the day you've given us so much alex i i'm so thankful for this conversation i feel right, like thank you thank you you've you've elevated you know the entire rebrand discussion to to reach new heights and uh you've you've set you know the standards and you continue to do so with your work and i can't wait to do to see what you do next but before we wrap up i just have one last ask you know if you were to kind of give like one piece of advice to someone who's going into a rebranding process you know eager to do their best work and to put their best foot forward you know what is something that could help guide them along the way in their decision something they can use kind of as their north star i guess okay so before you used to create a brand to attract customers to sell more products today you need to attract customers that so they build a brand for you and attract more customers so it's different it's it's reversed and this is my biggest learning i did type form the old way we listened a little bit to our customers but we basically created a brand to take them where we wanted to go i'm tra trying a different approach with video ask we are co-creating our brand and the as i said before the pictures and the imaginary thing is just an example a very clear visualization of this but literally everything in the way they in the words they use we use them on our communications everything um So if you are going to do a rebrand and you're going to start now and you don't know where to start, whatever, there's a clear process. You just need to Google. You just need to follow the future. The process is clear, but the, to me what's more important is that the mindset has to be I'm going to build it with them and for them. It has nothing to do with you. Yes, of course, you, you need to understand your business, but it's putting the customers at the center, what's going to actually make it even relevant for them um, and bring them along the journey. Maybe I would even consider if I had to do it now to say, hey, we're going to rebrand. What do you think about it? You know, like, why not? You know, like this idea of the big reveal. It's very interesting for a Mad Men episode, but it's, it's over. It doesn't it's just that it's not how the work the world works today, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so true i think that your opinion is very much reflective of the actual reality and it, it shows that you're very plugged into you know what's going on around you and in your customers lives uh and thank you for taking me along this incredible you know adventure of what it means yeah, to, happy to. Uh, kind of dive into all of this uh you know complexity and and beauty around us so thanks for sharing this with us uh i'm really I looking forward you know to what everyone's going to do with what they learn from you so thank you so much alex <laughs> thank you for having me i feel like i could talk about brands forever because like i feel like brands are like people and it's like human behavior at the end what we're talking about so i feel like i could be talking for this for like hours but maybe we'll leave it for a different session <laughs> but thanks for having me i really enjoyed the conversation and uh thanks for sharing me 
letting me share those ideas. Our pleasure, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for exploring another fascinating rebrand process with us. If you found it helpful, subscribe to the show and leave us a review. Until next time, this is Andra Zaharia. Thanks for watching The Drag and Drop Show by Creatopy.